we heard from Sue? Good evening. Welcome to this regularly scheduled meeting of the Independent School District 191's Board of Education. Uh, welcome to everybody attending here tonight and those watching this at home. Uh, we will begin with Pledge of Allegiance. Uh, Director Chester, would you lead us in that, please? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, and with liberty and justice for all. All right, thank you. Um, so, we'll first point on the agenda is the approval of tonight's agenda. Uh, if I could please have a motion for approval of the agenda. So moved. Moved by Director Chester. Second. Seconded by Director Kine. Ms. Kenny, will you please call the roll? Hume. Aye. Connor. Aye. Chester. Aye. Miller. Aye. Alt. Aye. Saeed. Uh, Saeed is not present at this time. Werb. Aye. The motion passes. Uh, then we will move to the information section of our meeting this evening, um, beginning with um, a recognition of activities in athletics by our director of athletics, Guillaume Peck. Guillaume, the microphone is yours. Thank you, Board Chair Miller, Superintendent Battle, and members of the school board. I appreciate the opportunity to share some of the wonderful accomplishments our students and teams in District 191 have, have achieved this year. Each of the people we'll honor tonight will recognize at the state or even national level. I'm fortunate to see these amazing talent, dedication, and character um, our students show at the, as they participate in activities and athletics throughout the year. They represent themselves, their peers, and our community in such a positive light, and I am proud of all their accomplishments. Due to the current circumstances surrounding COVID and in-person attendance at board meetings, we will read a little bit about the students' accomplishments and present photos of the students and teams. With that, the first students we will recognize tonight are members of the girls' swim team, uh, coached by Kimmaker. This year, sophomore Grace Affelt and senior Olivia Caldwell qualified for the state competition. Unfortunately, the state competition was canceled due to COVID. Swim coach Kim Herod called Olivia one of the hardest working and most dedicated athletes she has ever coached and said that Grace's dedication to chase all the small details that make her a great diver is inspiring to those around her. Um, next, we're going to recognize um, <clears throat> girls cross country coached by Charlie Burnham and uh, junior Zoe Dundon. Uh, she was named all conference and section runner, section runner up um, and qualified for the for state this year. Uh, Zoe ran a time of 18.58 at the section meet to qualify for the state tournament, which unfortunately due to COVID did not end up happening. Uh, Coach Charlie Burnham called Zoe talented, outgoing, competitive, and hardworking, saying she does everything well and that it takes a unique athlete with a lot of discipline and motivation to excel in as many ways as Zoe does. Congratulations, Zoe. Uh, <clears throat> next, we're going to recognize our wrestling program coached by Bill Soderholm. Uh, this year with COVID, the structure of the wrestling state tournament was uniquely different. The original eight sections were turned into four super sections, and those were considered part of the state tournament. Uh, Burnsville students who qualified for state were freshmen Aiden Ripplinger, sophomore Mom Blusoni, junior Xavier Ripplinger, and seniors Christian Lopez, Josh Laredo, and Cassius Howard. At uh, the tournament, Josh placed third, Aiden placed fourth, and Christian and Xavier placed fifth. Congratulations to the wrestling team and their success this season. Um, next, we have some uh, individual accomplishments from girls on our uh, girls hockey program, coached by Chris Upper. Uh, juniors Olivia Carlson, Zoe Dundon, and Katie Katzmerich, who are part of the Minnesota Girls Hockey Coaches Association Team Forest won the USA Hockey National High School Championship, the national tournament in Omaha in April. Uh, junior Sammy Bowlby competed at the USA Hockey National Tier 1 Hockey Tournament in Pennsylvania in April, and her team finished second in the nation. Um, 
her younger sister, freshman Addie Bowlby, was on the team that made the national semifinals for the Tier 1 U14 team at the USA Hockey National Tournament in Pennsylvania in, in April. Congratulations to Olivia, Zoe, Katie, Sammy, and Addie. We look forward to your successes with Blaze Hockey next year. Um, the next program we're going to recognize is our weightlifting program, coached our Olympic and Power program, coached by Justin Leopold. Uh, junior Ellie Horn competed in Olympic and power in both Olympic and powerlifting this year. She placed third at state and Olympic and was a state champion in the powerlifting state tournament. Senior Max Zitnik took second place at the state Olympic and second place at the state powerlifting. Uh, junior, junior Dylan Fisher placed third at Olympic state and second at powerlifting state. Sophomore Christian Savangse was a state champion at powerlifting. Um, Ellie, Max, Dylan, and Christian were all members of the powerlifting team that took third place at the state meet. Uh, junior Karsten Tompkins placed second at the Olympic state meet. These lifters continue to push through tough times and always look to raise the bar at Burnsville High School and beyond. Congratulations. Uh, next is our boys alpine skiing coached by Tim Bachman. Uh, Forrest Bowman, uh, a junior, qualified for state and ultimately placed 28th out of 88 participants in the competition. Coach Tim Bachman said that Forrest had his best year as a ski racer and was an outstanding leader and role model as a team captain. Congratulations, Forrest, on your success this year. Um, next up is Girls Nordic Ski coached by Gabby Ayers. Um, this year was freshman Kaylin Ambiel's first year as a state qualifier. Kaylin placed 99th out of the 156 athletes I believe. Coach Ayers said, Kaylin's hard work and driven attitude got her to state. She is an impressive young woman and a determined athlete. Congratulations, Kaylin. We look forward to, to watching your success in the coming years. <clears throat> um, next is Deca coached by Jenna Splutstoser and Michelle Carroll. Congratulations to the following students that advanced to the state DECA competition this year. Gia Cornolo, Lindsey Brown, Kirsten Buckner, Savannah Drum, Jack Holmstrom, Teresa Levu, Marshall Noring, Zoe Olson, Adam Stadick, Andy Tran, and Jacob Westerland. In addition, Jacob Westerland advanced to the finals of the state championship or state competition. Uh, next, debate and speech, coached by Derek Tano and Katherine Ryder. Our debate and speech teams uh, were represented at state this year, and our speech team will be represented at two different national tournaments this year. Competing at classic debate state this year, were Ellie Hoped, uh, Karina Benson, Siham Ibrahim, Isabella Lee, Angelina Lee, Lexi Pornolo, Austin Warfa, Nora Selby, Katie Pearson, Natalie Mua, Isabel Lang, Rayan Sharif, and Saliko Jama. In the State High School League Speech Tournament, Zoe Lewis was a state qualifier in dramatic interpretation, and Ellie Sheldberg placed fourth in humorous interpretation. Ellie also advanced to the National Individual Event Tournament of Champions, where she competed in humorous interpretation. Additionally, Ellie and Zoe will participate in the National Speech and Debate Tournament. Zoe will compete in program oral interpretation and Ellie in humorous interpretation. Next up is our HOSA program. Um, and in particular, teachers Ann Warner Dempsey and Susie Stas. Health Occupation Students of America, or HOSA, offer skill based competitions for students. At both the Midwinter and State Leadership Competitions, senior David Wilkins placed first in HOSA Bowl teamwork events, which qualifies him for a HOSA international competition, which will be held this summer. Senior Carson Zerb placed third and fourth respectively at the Midwinter and State Leadership Competitions and Pharmacology Health Science Related Events. Advisor Ann Warner Dempsey said that both David and Carson have shown great leadership and passion this year 
praising them for adapting in this year's virtual platform. Next up is our Quiz Bowl, coached by Les Moffitt. Congratulations to the Burnsville Quiz Bowl A team, which went undefeated in the 2021 Minnesota State Quiz Bowl tournament that was held virtually March 6th. The team consists of seniors Joe Schatz, Wyatt Isaacson, and Nate Trussell, and juniors Julian Banlau and Iris Gordon. Julian finished the tournament as the overall leading score. Earlier this year, at the Individual Player National Championship Tournament on April 11th, Joe tied for 57th out of 11, while Nate tied, I'm sorry, 100 and I think that's 100 for 101, while Nate tied 77th and Iris tied for 101st. Uh, quiz Bowl teams A and B will be competing in the National Championship May 29th and 30th. The tournament will be held virtually. Senior Luke Trussell, Junior Carter Stewart, and sophomores John Gittle and Charlie McGuire make up the Burnsville B team. Congratulations, Quiz Bowl, and best wishes as you compete in Nationals. Our next program is Band, uh, Keith French and Molly Holmes. Uh, junior Jacob Miller qualified for All-State Symphonic Band, and Junior Calvin York qualified for All-State Band this year. Jacob plays trombone, and Calvin plays the flute. Students audition for All-State spots in March and in mid-April. The, the Minnesota Music Educators Association All-State Committee chooses the final rosters considering scores and policies. Um, next up is our choir program, led by Jacqueline Schmeichel. Congratulations to senior Sophia Kameni, who was named to the 2020-2021 All-State Choir. Students audition for an All-State spot in March and in mid-April. The Minnesota Music Educators Association All-State Committee chooses the final rosters considering scores and policies. Director Jacqueline Schmeichel said Sophia exemplifies the values of hard work, diligence, and passion. Sophia is planning to attend Georgetown University next fall and major in international politics. Um, next up is our robotics programs, um, <clears throat> led by Sean Leonard and David Peters. The Wiring Warriors qualified for the Minnesota FTC State Championship by winning the Control Award, sponsored by Arm Inc., an award for excellence in programming at the 7th Minnesota FTC Qualifier on March 6th. The Wiring Warriors include Jacob Kalenius, Eloisa Carrasco, William Moe, Corvus Murphy, Ashton Thompson, and Nathan Wild. Congratulations to them. Uh, next, the State Science Fair, um, led by Mike Hugh-Moller. Uh, in spite of the challenges of COVID and comp uh, competition going virtual, there were several students this year who advanced to the State Science Fair and beyond for their projects. Students receiving state and national recognition for their science fair projects include Cade Bunnell, Ava Drobnik, Johannes Machete, Elizabeth Genus, Jacob Johnson, Audra Johnson, Urshad Molim, Maisie Schuneman, Evelyn Shiro, and Liu Tanker. Science teacher and fair advisor Mike Hewoller said the project requirements were unchanged from past years, but students were forced to work harder and without as much direct support than in a normal year. Um, and then finally, we have uh, Nicolette's, or Nicolette, uh, Nicolette's chess team led by Brian Rudnick. Uh, one final recognition, though not a high school activity, the Nicollet Knights Middle School Chess Team won the 2021 Middle School Chess State Championship held virtually on April 10th through the 11th. It was Nicollet's first time in school history to win the state chess title. The team's scorers were Ronaldo Mejia, who placed fourth, Jacob Schoenbauer, who placed sixth, and Owen Stieglitz who earned the 11th place trophy, and Gino Charlotte. The team then went on to finish sixth at the National Middle School Tournament. In addition, the team's sixth graders took first place at the SCA Statewide Elementary Championship earlier this fall. The statewide individual champion, Nicollet's own Carrie Crawford. Also scoring for the Knights were Connor Joseph, John Bloomer, and Thomas Pritchard. Other members of the team were Spencer Peterson, Isabel Burknett, and Xavier Sanchez. 
Thank you so much for your time. Thank you, uh, Guillaume. Uh, board members, any desire to make any comments? No, I, I think I'll speak for all of us in uh, recognizing the accomplishments of our uh, students and in all fields. It's, it's fantastic to see this stuff. Thank you. All right, the next section is uh, a recognition of tonight for the John Koshkin Award recipients. Uh, Aaron Tinkleberg, Director of Communications. Aaron is serving multiple duties this evening. So. <laughs> thank you. Thank you for your patience. Uh, thank you, Chair Miller, uh, Superintendent Battle, and members of the board. Um, to, tonight we're just going to be celebrating uh, some of the outstanding uh, volunteers, the John Cosgren Volunteer Award winners. Uh, we did receive quite a few nominations this year, which was excellent um, because last year we had to, unfortunately, bypass on, the, on doing the awards because of the timing of the pandemic. Um, so a couple of this year's award winners are, are being recognized really for work over the course of their uh, time or over the last two years. So with that, I'll turn it back over to Chair Miller. Thank you, Aaron. It's uh, my pleasure to say a few words about each of this year's John Koskin Volunteer Award winners. This is the 19th year that the awards have been given out. They are named in honor of John Koskin, a longtime advocate for volunteerism who served 34 years at Catholic Charities and retired as associate director in 1993. Mr. Koskin also served as a member of this District 191 Board of Education. The awards are given in four categories, students, parents, community members, and staff members. First up is parent award winner, Shanna MacArthur. Shanna is a parent of two students at Neal Elementary School and has been consistently supporting the school since her oldest child entered kindergarten six years ago. She has served as the volunteer coordinator for the school's parent-teacher organization for four years, organizing meals for teachers during conferences, bringing together volunteers for family fun night, and working closely with the school's social worker to support setup, distribution, and cleanup for Neil's food pantry. Shana also is an active community volunteer. As part of the nomination, Neil teacher Kelly Allman wrote, it's a lot of work to round up volunteers for all the events that occur throughout the school year, but Shana never wavers and is doing whatever she can to find the people to help. Congratulations, Shana, and thank you for all you do. Next are our community member award winners. First is Linda Nelson. <clears throat> More than 15 years ago, Linda helped found Foundation 191 which provides grants that enhance learning opportunities for District 191 students and served as the organization's secretary and historian from inception through last year. Linda provided support and leadership in fundraising efforts that have included read-alongs, entertainment events, galas, silent auctions, and golf tournaments. Her work helped the foundation grow from a fledgling organization that to one that has given more than $125,000 in grants over the years. In their nomination, members of the Foundation 191 board wrote that Linda, quote, has given much to every student in District 191 since 2005, providing innovative opportunities they would not have had without her tireless work. Congratulations and thank you, Linda Nelson. Our other community member award winner is our award winners are Marilyn Brennan, Barb Kanoki, Maggie McKinney, and Dorothy Rose. These four women are everyday volunteer receptionists at the Burnsville Senior Center, managing the reception desk and answering phones while the center is open. When the COVID-19 pandemic first started and the center was essentially shut down, they stood up and volunteered to answer phones to ensure seniors heard a caring, compassionate voice at the other end of the line. During a time when seniors were most isolated and scared, these women provided just what was needed. Taking turns and working alone in the center, they took as many as 50 calls a day for more than four months, sometimes just providing a friendly voice, 
but often providing important information about community education classes, COVID testing, food, medical needs, and much more. Senior Center Manager Michelle Starkey wrote, this is the very best of what this district hopes to represent to its community. Thank you and congratulations to Marilyn, Barb, Maggie, and Dorothy. Next is our staff member award winner, Sherry Gilbertson. Sherry is an educational assistant at Vista View Elementary School who also volunteers at the school. Having participated in extensive training, Sherry works with comfort dog Gideon to bring comfort, joy, peace, and love to our students, especially those who have experienced trauma in their lives. Sherry and Gideon spend time reading, playing, listening, and interacting with students in every grade, even when it had to be done at a distance. Sherry and Gideon also work in the community, providing comfort following traumatic events and to witnesses who are testifying in court. In nominating Sherry, co-worker Barb Cermak wrote, the love that she has spread, the lives that she has affected, the sunshine that has poured out from within her is immeasurable. Thank you, Sherry, and thank you, Gideon, for supporting our students and staff. Last, we'll recognize this year's student award winners, Alexis and Andrew Bonnell. Seniors at Burnsville High School, these siblings were nominated by seven different people, which certainly speaks to the breadth of the impact they've had on their school and the 191 community. They have combined to volunteer more than 4,000 hours of service during their years at Burnsville High School and have taken on leadership roles in formal activities like Student Council and Burnsville Strong as well as informal self-directed activities such as organizing ACT prep for students during spring break or cleanup days around Sunset Pond in their neighborhood. In the nominations they received, they were cited for their dedication to improving the lives of others, for their innovation, and for the inspiration they provide fellow students and adults. Congratulations and thank you to Alexis and Andrew Bunnell. I am constantly impressed and inspired by the volunteers in our community, volunteers who make 191 truly strong. There really is a spirit of service among our students, our staff, and our entire community. And it's one of the things that makes me most proud to be part of this community. Once again, thank you and congratulations to the 2021 John Koshkin Volunteer Award winners. Board members, uh, any desire to add anything to that? No, thank you. Well, again, thank you to all the award winners this evening. That's typically a more formal event with folks coming up to the podium and everything, but we'll get back to that soon, I promise you. Okay, we are now on to the point where we're gonna recognize our student representative tonight. Um, our student representative, Noka May Adesu is going to be leaving after having served her year of service here with us. Um, so I just have a couple comments to make on, on, uh, be, uh, on her departure. I just want to take a moment to recognize and thank our student representative, Milka May Adesu, for her service to this board, Burnsville High School, and to District 191 as a whole. While part of her role is providing updates to the Board of Education, which we hear during these board meetings, the more impactful work she's done has been somewhat out of our view. Milka May has been instrumental in building a stronger connection between the students of BHS and both school and district leadership. In particular, she's helped ensure student voices are heard so that better decisions are made on issues that affect students directly. That's something that I'm very hopeful will continue in the future. She's also helped engage students for conversations around important school and district issues this year, including the role of school resource officers, plans for safety returning, safely returning to school last fall, and providing input for updating our strategic vision and core values. I understand that she plans to attend the new school in New York, where she'll join their dual bachelor's and master's program, and plans to major in the history of design and curatorial studies. And for the record, I had to look that up, but it's a very interesting degree that she's going for. 
Milka May, thank you for your leadership and partnership. We are very proud and grateful to have joined you, or to have you join us this year. Thank you. Uh, traditionally, we welcome our new member. Uh, the, our new uh, representative is not uh, able to join us this evening due to some unplanned events, so um, we will be welcoming, hopefully welcoming them at our next meeting. So. All right, on to uh, the next item on our agenda is to hear a report about open facilities led by Lisa Ryder, Executive Director of Business Services. Lisa? Hello and good evening. Um, this report is with regard to open facilities, an update for the board and the public at this time. I will, uh, next slide please, the overview for tonight and what we will be covering include these items that you see on the slide. Um, we'll cover this tonight. It's intended to be an update on the status of our open facilities and a brief summary of how we got here. Uh, more detailed uh, more detail is also being provided related to the planned location for the best inclusion at Diamond Head Education Center. Next slide. As we take a look at the guiding change and action plan, we won't go into these. Just a reminder that the guiding change basically is an, a document that identifies our current situation, the outcomes we want to achieve, and the things that are not acceptable to us in that process. So as we discuss open facilities back in April of 2020, that was created. And we want to just make sure people always know they can find that here. In addition, the action plan is in, included as well. This action plan was approved by the board on October 22nd, 2020, and authorizes the next steps for possible sale or lease of open facilities for ISD 191. Because our legislation did not make it through this past legislative session, we will be looking to, in October, bring forward um, this type of legislation once again for the next legislative session. Next slide, please. Our purpose and commitment, this has not changed from before. Our purpose is to maximize the use of our open facilities. And um, as we're all aware of our needs having been shifting quite a bit this past year, we wanna make sure we're leveraging our resources as efficiently as possible. We continue to have the commitment throughout the process to include the items that you see listed here, including that open and transparent engagement resulting in the cost-effective use of our facilities and resources. Next slide. River Ridge Education Center, April was very busy for us as during that month, a purchase offer was received, secured by Transwestern, our brokers, and the board authorized the signing of a purchase agreement on April 8th with a purchase agreement prepared by our attorney signed by the board chair and clerk uh, later that month. Our closing is set um, for August 18th of 2021 on or before that date. So with that in mind, next slide please. We now need to consider our best program. And our plans for the best program is to include them here at Diamond Head Education Center. Boxes have already been sent over and delivered to our staff there with the intent that all items will be packed by the end of the day, June 11. After which then we will have scheduled moves for the equipment, boxes and furniture. We will likely utilize a vendor for assistance in that process. We also have held larger team meetings to gather our needs, ideas, and concerns around the use of our Diamond Head location. And um, this information has been reviewed and proposed, uh, has been reviewed by the executive leadership team. And our proposed use of the space at Diamond Head has, has had that review. Our current estimates for the retrofitting that will be required are expected to fall within the range of 400,000 to 600,000. So the next slide shows a visual of the Diamond Head Education location. And this is the part of the building that is um, only the upper level. There is no lower level to this section of the building. And so if, if um, this is a parking lot over here on the right side of the screen where between it says door two and then door three. And so you see the highlighted rooms in yellow uh, those include the spaces that we anticipate that best will occupy. 
the space between door two and door three highlighted in yellow, including the shared space and use of the um, campus cup for best and all of the Diamond Head Education Center users. Our next slide discusses um, things that have come up through our conversation. So a few notes that we wanted to make about what we noted from our review. Um, there's a continued need for storage as is typically the case um, that continues in our long-term safe flow of traffic around Diamond Head Education Center. As we consider now the need for bus lanes and parent drop-off for you know, two different programs, that is something that um, continues to concern us, not knowing exactly what the layout of our traffic flow will be able to be should outlets be sold in this area. So we want to make sure that we're kind of keeping an eye on that and understanding the needs. And frankly, we'll need to watch very closely this next year to see how everything flows. The equipment and management of materials from our closed buildings is also something still in process. And that will need to be included in our long-term facility plan, which will be necessary as we move forward. And the guiding change is currently under development. Next slide, please. So as we remind ourselves around the Diamond Head Education Center and the next steps here, um, the action plan from October of 2020 that the board had approved does consider the sale and redevelopment of two to four acres of the parking lot at Diamond Head Education Center. Um, the concern raised during our process of identifying the use of our space by our best program is simply the the acknowledgement of the use of parking spaces in order to create bus lanes that along with um, that will decrease our potentially 40 to 80 parking spaces depending upon what that long term bus lane and safe flow of traffic looks like. So given that we just want to keep that at the forefront too as that will need to be considered as um, further development of the sale of outlots of Diamond Head is considered by the board. Next slide please. So Metcalf Middle School, this is currently being used every Tuesday afternoon by our open door, which provides food for our community in the parking lot drive through model. Um, it's also understood that, um, you know, we'll give 30 days notice should open door need to, to end that use of that building. But at this point in time, that's just continuing until um, at least September from their perspective. Additionally, Dakota County Public Health has been using the facility to vaccinate our community. Um, this use by the Dakota County may be coming to an end um, in the next few weeks. So we're, we're kind of waiting to see what their decision is there with regard to the, um, the use of, of Metcalf Middle School. Um, after meetings that have been held with the City of Egan and the City of Burnsville around Metcalf, um, the City of Egan is, is reaching out to Ellers, who is working with us um, with regard to and getting updates and having conversations around potential future uses. So we know that's all in the works as well. Um, at this point, we are in a holding pattern for now as we discussed last board meeting and under current guidance we will likely pick up that marketing of Metcalf Middle School after the first of the year. As we take a look at the Cedar School, next slide. Almost half of the Cedar School is currently leased through June 30 of 2022. And we continue to have some questions with regard to you know how and what portion of the building would be um, utilized by our current lessee and if that should continue beyond June 30 of 22. So those conversations are in the works and um, just take some time to, to work through. So we know that that is started and um, we look forward to learning more as we go. Next slide, please. Our Sioux Trail and Marion W. Savage building have been used this past year for childcare and as, um, as needed for testing locations. So we, um, we do know that from the action plan that should the need of the use of those buildings for COVID purposes, um, as that comes to an end, then we should be continuing to actively work to find non-competitive partners. And we are fielding calls as they come regarding the possible lease of space within um, potentially one of those buildings. 
At this time, no brokerage services have been assigned to this process at this time. As far as next steps, next slide, please. Next steps, we would be continuing to complete our preparation for the inclusion of BEST at Diamond Head Education Center. We will continue our discussion with 917 for future Cedar facility use, understanding whatever impact that might mean to our Burnsville Alternative High School. Um, in October, we would be looking to initiate those conversations again to prepare a legislative exemption for approval by the legislature. And lastly, we would begin and plan to discuss with developers in January for Metcalf Middle School and Diamond Head Outlet. The purpose of waiting until January is aligning that discussion with the possible then passage of legislation that would take place uh, approximately in June or later, and therefore, um, I should say by June, and therefore our conversations from January to June would be well placed as far as the timeline would work. Next slide. With that, I would just like to thank you for your time this evening and in providing this information that concludes our report on open facilities. Thank you, Lisa Ryder. Uh, we'll open it up for any questions or comments from board members. Thank you. Um, thank you, Lisa. Just a, a couple questions. Um, you had mentioned in your presentation a long-term facility plan um, with open facilities. Can you elaborate on that? Um, now that we have, um, we, we always have had a 10-year long-term facility maintenance plan. And so separately from that, as we now have open facilities, there's a necessity for us to really examine the operational costs, the maintenance costs, the um, options and opportunities that there might be for lease or sale of those properties beyond that which that we've talked about. So the board has laid out that which is related to sale of properties. But when we're talking about MW Savage or Sutrell at this time, that's been more around just leasing. And so as a district, we would want to make sure that we're kind of reviewing all of our sites, all of the square footage that we have so that we can put together a long-term plan for the use of those buildings, um, identifying various different needs that uh, we may have district-wide and how we can best utilize that space. We haven't necessarily had a formal long-term facility plan in the past, and we believe that is a necessity moving forward in the development of that guiding changes in the works. Thank you. So um, I, just to make sure I understand you correctly, um, it's not just an open facilities, it's not just a long-term plan for our open facilities. It's a district-wide plan being again, you know, kind of similar to the, the, the project and finding efficiencies in the district. This would be the, the bricks and mortar side of it across the district in terms of where upgrades need to happen, where we might need to update space, yeah. et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, it's just okay. a more cohesive look at that whole op, um, area of the district and the, and the facilities that we have. Awesome. Um, and if you could refresh my memory, I know we've covered it before. Um, the investment of four hundred to six hundred thousand uh, dollars mm -hmm. to include best. Where is that coming from? So, as you recall, as we discussed this in planning a year ago, three hundred thousand dollars had been set aside for purposes of retrofitting in our estimates at that time. Since then, we have also learned that um, approximately three hundred thousand, after our calculations are done must be set aside from the sale proceeds for purposes of only special ed expenditures. And we believe that that use of those funds would make good sense in preparing the space here at Diamond Head Education Center for the BEST program, which is a special education program. We have um, communicated with MDE with regard to our needs, our anticipated needs for that retrofitting and um, they have authorized the fact that these funds that would be set aside from the sale proceeds because we used 450000 back in 2016 for the development of River Ridge out of federal special ed funds, um, that those $300,000 could be utilized for that purpose then. And so the 300000 that we're setting aside for special ed would be specifically targeted at student spaces? Yes. 
Yes. Just the special ed programming spaces that okay. we have. It, it could also be for the, the staff of the special ed program as necessary in order to function that, you know, have that program function. Gotcha. Um, and then I just kind of a thought popped into my mind as you were talking about Cedar School and recognizing that there's a new superintendent there, you know, new leadership. Um, again, not knowing what uh, 917 will decide, has there been any discussion, um, and I'm kind of looking long term in, in terms of the possible need for board discussion on Cedar School to possibly include it in the legislative exemption? Has, if, 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 for example, 917 decides not to occupy Cedar School, um, we're kind of on a tight deadline in terms of possibly learning that and be able, being able to have that discussion, um, not wanting, I mean, just to at least decide, is that something that this board is interested in? Is it something that staff would recommend? Right, um, although they have had transition, we have um, recently had a conversation with 917 that um, just opened the conversation, and so we look forward to that continuing as we move forward. I, I want to remind people that they have a process they work through with their member districts as well, and yep. so in respect of that, it's a matter of a timing matter. So we do know that um, the conversations need to take place. I hear your question being around, will we know enough information by October when we're going to yeah. um, bring forward that proposed legislation for the next session? And I think by that point in time, we would have further information for the board to be able to make that determination of how inclusive that might need to be uh, for the Cedar building at that time. I would certainly welcome that if we could, if, if we could, <laughs> you know, if they're not already aware of our timing, understanding that they, of course, have, have their own timing. Um, but, you know, this is kind of a once in a lifetime thing for our district in terms of inclusion or not including in a legislative exemption. Right. Director Alt, uh, members of the board, I'll add a little bit about the uh, timeline they've shared with us. So they have an interim superintendent, John Christensen, who's also working with the current superintendent, Mark Zuzek. They expect to update the new superintendent immediately after July 1st, um, uh, assistant superintendent favor. Um, and then at that time, that's when they'll begin the discussion based on his input and when he talks to his board chair and his chair to map it out. And so they can be clear on what their request is um, about the lease and if they need expansion. Great, thank you. So that's the timeline, hopefully soon in July. Threading, threading the needle. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> that's all. Oh, thank you. And, and one note, I'm not 100% sure that it's even a matter of uh, concern because the, the, the example we saw Granted, we're in sort of gray water here with this uh, legislative exemption, but the example we were given, I don't believe had any buildings listed on it. It was a sort of an open ticket for the district. Got it. So, but so we would just need to know how much to include. That was even somewhat open, even I think. Even something uh, open, okay. Because, you know, it's subjected to the whims of the market, too, so. True, okay. But good to know, thank we'll you. We'll see. It's a good point to bring up, thank you. Any other uh, questions or comments? Yes. I had a couple of questions about the um, best move to Diamond Head. Um, you mentioned some concerns about traffic flow with parent drop-off and bus drop-off, and I'm curious what your thoughts on how that, I mean, you, you kind of alluded to it, I think, but how that might affect our possible future sale of the outlots at Diamond Head. Right, so we have identified um, a potential plan and there will be further conversations with our transportation company and taking just a little closer look at that. Um, essentially, the, the space that will be utilized by the BEST program will be between this um, door two and door three. The thinking is that that is along that wall on the outside is also where the bus lanes would be. And the question that we now have is just the combination and the timing of when like BEST students are in that same space, when is it that the early childhood students are in that space, and how do we separate then the parents of our early childhood students from the bus lane? So that's in the works. We know it's a concern. We want to make sure that we've got the safest um, possible use of that space, so we're involving some experts with regard to how that can be finalized. Okay, great. And my other question, I just I was looking at the diagram, and I just wanted to 
under, better understand where the best program will be located in the building, and is it going to will it have what sort of an impact might it have on our other programming we already have here around community ed and early childhood? Right. Yeah, that's why we held our meetings with um, all of the team here at Diamond Head involved. So every department <coughs> was able to understand the anticipated use of space and the impacts that that may have upon their programming. So all of that was kind of discussed and worked through, and we feel we are in a really good place now. Okay, thank you. Any other board member comments or questions? Okay, thank you. Well, I had asked uh, for... I think we, a number of us had asked for this update, um, given that uh, sort of an ongoing large-scale project. So I hope um, it sort of grounds us all a little bit where we are in that. In that, um, we'll probably plan on doing something like this again in the semi near future, or down the road later in the summer or something. Just check in, and see where we're at. So. Okay. Um, next, we're going to move to a report about QComp, aka ProPay. Uh, speaking on this matter is Katie Ness, Continuous Improvement Coach and QComp Coordinator. Ms. Ness, welcome. Thank you. Good evening, Chair Miller, Superintendent Battle, and members of the board. Uh, my name is Katie Ness, and I am a Continuous Improvement Coach and the QComp Coordinator. I'm here in 191, and I am here to present to you the findings of our annual review the recommendations for the 21-22 school year and what we did in response to the COVID-19 pandemic. Our work supports the QComp Quality Compensation Law, which is made up of four components. Those components being career ladder options, job embedded professional development, teacher evaluation, and performance pay. For a district our size, MDE suggests we survey three sites. This year, we surveyed Rodden Elementary, Gideon Pond Elementary, the Virtual Academy uh, Elementary Teachers, uh, Eagle Ridge Middle School, the Pathways and Elective Teachers at Burnsville High School, ECSE, ECFE, and the Best Staff. Data was collected from probationary and tenured teachers, along with teacher leaders and administrators around areas of implementation, impact on instruction, and then impact on student achievement and their learning. Next slide. And actually, I just covered this so we can go to the next one. Thank you. So regarding overall impact, four things really stood out in our report this year. Equity continues to be at the center of the continuous improvement coaches practices. We are consistently seeking out learning opportunities on how to coach for equity and utilize an equity lens when observing uh, teachers and staff members and working in partnership with them. Our collaborative teams continue to feel their work is impacting student learning and achievement with our elementary teachers citing that their consistent review of student data to guide their win groups as one of the most successful components of their collaborative team and our secondary sites really citing AVID uh, school-wide implementation of social emotional learning and CPSS strategies uh, to name a few of things that they found really successful this year. Both our tenured and probationary staff see the impact and cited the uh, growth that they feel they um, had in this challenging year uh, around the observation process um, and continue to see the benefits to their practice. And this year with the addition of the collegial conversation, staff expressed that job embedded professional development along with the opportunity for additional reflection and action steps into their practice had a positive impact on both their learning and the learning of their students. Next slide. So under the guidance of Governor Walls, we modified our standard practices in order to support staff. So what we did is 10-year teacher observations went from three to two, with probationary teachers observations remaining at three in order to comply with state statute. What this did was eliminated the other trained 
observer observations that our building leadership team members typically conduct. And along with this modification, we offered an alternative to our traditional observation format, and that is the collegial conversation. Under this new format, teachers selected an article or a resource that was picked based on its support of the district focus areas of equity and anti-racism and high quality instruction. I am excited to welcome Brianna Meisner. She's a kindergarten teacher over at William Byrne Elementary, and she's gonna share a little bit uh, with you about her experience. Go ahead, Brianna. Hello, and thank you so much for hearing me out and getting to hear about what an awesome and impactful experience it was to get to have this as my coaching experience this year for my second um, observation, so to speak. Uh, one of the best parts of this was the autonomy that it gave me. I've often felt that as wonderful as those coaching conversations are, it's gotten routine after being in the district for a while. And this really shook things up for me. I felt like it was finally that not one size fits all, but rather met me where I was at and let me grow and examine my practice, my connections with my students, my colleagues, parents that I work with, and really let me grow as a professional. So that autonomy was just huge. We always often talk about what that does for our students, and I felt it as an actual professional in this. The actions I was able to take and move forward with over the two weeks that the conversations took place with a pre-conversation, action steps on my own, and then a post were really a very reflective time for me. I noticed my students in new ways and was able to think about how I connect with them on a daily basis and how I connect with their families, how I even speak about them, how I think about them. And I saw new things about my students within those weeks. And actually it's just continued all year long since the beginning of this conversation for me. That reflection process has made me so excited about the possible opportunity of continuing these conversations. It just opens up a new way of being able to reflect, not only with myself, but when my colleagues are also having these one-on-one -on -one conversations with a coach, we tend to get excited and then we talk to each other about it. And that excites me even more because it's providing us another opportunity to have equity conversations mm -hmm. in a very natural way. It's not a canned answers and reflections and write out your thoughts. It's really truly, what are you living every day in your classroom? Mm -hmm. That impact on students, our families and our colleagues is really what drove me to get excited about this and ask questions. And I know I was in my post conversation with my coach saying, what can we do to continue this? Because this is one of the most meaningful things I've participated in in our district in a really long time. And I don't want it to end here. It's a blessing from our pandemic experience and I'm excited and hopeful that we'll get to continue it. Thank you. Thank you, Brianna. So based on our survey results and the impact that the COVID-19 pandemic had on our staff and students, we are recommending that uh, administrators and building leaders continue to utilize the professional development modules that were created and we, we titled them previously as the CT Reboot. Now that we've had those in place, we would like to continue to use those modules to further build effective teams. We would also like to have continued professional development on purposeful data work uh, really diving into data and looking at student needs to drive our win conversations and win being what I need small group instruction. We also recommend uh, to further support our district's commitment to equity and anti-racism. We want to look at our current framework, which is the Danielson framework for teaching and uh, look at it under a lens for alignment with our CPSS uh, work. 
And then also with that, have ongoing calibration uh, with the Danielson framework um, with our administrators and teacher leaders. The collegial conversations uh, were definitely a bright spot in this year uh, for many staff members in our district. So because they were able to provide that personalized job embedded professional development, we recommend that this format can continue to be an option in the future. And finally, mentor supports. Uh, mentor supports continue to be a growth area in our program. And so we would like to really elevate our current mentor support and then further partner with the CSA department on how we can enhance our current practices to really reach our probationary staff at all different levels, year one, two, and three of their probationary years. And the final slide. So thank you again for having me this evening here. Uh, I know that you have, have the slides. I've linked our QCOMP review, review report, the planning process, and then also a link to MDE's website if you need any further information on the QCOMP program uh, at the state level. Thank you. Thank you, Katie Ness. Uh, any board members, any questions or comments about QCOMP? sounds really good and this is really what uh, the, the program should be doing. I mean, that's what it sounds like to me. Oh, this is the one that goes on the There we go. Okay, sorry about that. Could you, can you hear me now? Um, yes, I just wanted to comment to Brianna that it sounds like she really got some um, insight to what this program should really be about. And it just sounds really exciting and interesting to hear that um, she's getting that this program is working and it's not just something on paper that it's actually working. So I'm thrilled to hear about that. Any other uh, questions? Yes, Director Og. Uh, thank you, Katie. I always um, look forward to this to this report. Um, and I guess you know probably just to provide some context for you know as a new board that ProPay really is something. Um, that fortunately, we're fortunate to receive funding from the state for. Um, and it's for something that we have to do anyway. Um, so in that sense, we are able to have instructional coaches like Katie um, and um, through the ProPay funding, um, we're able to um, really cover some of the expense of what we already have to do. It's really about the adults um, and the adult learning. Um, and I guess um, just a couple comments. I really did appreciate having sat through now eight of these reports. Um, the last couple of years, the reports have gotten um, become much more interesting and really describing some very real change in terms of what's going on in the professional development of our teachers. Um, I just. Eight years is a long time to wait for change. Um, and, you know, we hear rosy pictures of, you know, teachers talking about how they've improved achievement. And I'll ask the question tonight, um, how do you know? And, and, and I'm not basing achievement simply on the test, because we know that testing is an important part of what we do, but it's not everything that, you know, that, that um, encompasses achievement and success for our students. But, how is it that teachers know when student achievement is being improved year over year? Because it's, if we're looking, and again, it goes back to the dashboard, Dr. Battle, that we're looking for. <laughs> um, but, you know, it, if I look simply at the test scores, um, we're making only modest improvements. Right. And, and I think, you know, this is a, a an honest question that as, as classroom teachers, we consistently ask ourselves and um, hold ourselves to high standards and, and accountable. And, you know, QCOMP is a program to put structures in place. Um, and it's just one of the many things that contribute to the success of our teachers and of our students. Uh, I was looking at this 
framework for equity and the other pieces that are crucial in student success, it, it calls out the students feeling of belonging, um, a place where they feel that they can be successful mm -hmm. and have access. And I think that we're addressing those things in our social emotional curriculum, the adoption of second step. Mm -hmm. um, I know our district equity team is doing some really great work. And I think that with all of these different structures in place, um, yes, we hope to see it in our students grow social emotional, um, socially and emotionally, but also then eventually, you know, in some of these high state standards. Yeah. Director all Yeah. Members of the board, thank you, Katie, for that. I'd like to add that, um, appreciate you adding um, the assessment of our children's learning should not just be standardized test scores, because as we know, the research shows that it doesn't always show the brilliance of our students, especially for our BIPOC students. And so expanding that definition of how do we know our children are learning so as Katie mentioned, you need to look at uh, those social emotional factors because if a child doesn't believe they are seen, valued and cared, mm -hmm. they're not going to learn from any teacher. Mm -hmm. And so as I look at the development of our dashboard, it will be more comprehensive. And just to give you an example of one of the ways you can tell if children are learning is what you saw in my state of the schools. When we had Ms. Christian's second graders tell what they've learned and such confidence clearly articulating and being very specific and so to me that's one of the greatest indicators is listening to our children because they will tell you and so if you have not watched the state of the school this is a little plug the highlight is not me it's our children so from the winter drum line what an example of what they've learned if you look at their performance. Miss Christian, second grade, second graders, and then the ending of the video was a ninth grade advisory class from Burnsville High School. Uh, original creative piece that shared who they are, why we are strong as a district. And so the teachers provide the learning environment so that our kids can shine and show their brilliance. And so thank you for the question and allowing this opportunity for Katie and me to share a little bit more about how we're re-looking at success for our children and more to be continued as we develop the strategic plan. And I'm so hungry for that dashboard because, um, you know, I can't talk to all of the students and, you know, the student stories are very powerful. They're very, they're, they're very important. But in a presentation like this, you know, simply hearing from t I guess you know maybe that's something to consider for future with a, with the the pro pay report some sort of acknowledgement to the dashboard when it does come because simply saying that teachers are saying student achievement has improved it doesn't give me anything to go on and I appreciate that it's there and I know that you're seeing it but um, those stories are important um, and I also just wanted to say I, I appreciate the part the the expectation to partner with CISA um, and also the, you know, alignment of what we're doing with CPSS because that's really where we're going to make a difference for our kids. And um, it just makes me very hopeful. So thank you. Any other comments, questions about? Yeah, I have one comment. Yep. Um, I'm at all at, you know, how much is also driven from some of our teachers here who are able to reflect, who are able to discuss these topics. Um, it's not something that I kind of grew up on. So I want to applaud, you know, our great staff and educators for being able to, you know, bring it to the service. Um, Brianna mentioned the reflection piece and being able to regroup with her colleagues and talk about it too. Um, and that space, giving them space to talk about it. And I really appreciate that. And, I'm so amazed by the program, and I'm, I can't wait to hear more about it. Well, I'd like to, um, just one comment. I, you know, you, you, it's funny, you, I had a question, and then you had it in your presentation. So, um, but I, I was uh, 
going to ask about the integration of CPSS and the language and uh, common languages and tools and um, environments that are involved with that. So I'm happy to see that that's being integrated and I wholeheartedly encourage that. We have uh, um, uh, embraced that in our um, program here and I'd love to see that as part of the coaching process. So I, I, I'm happy to see that we're doing that. Please continue doing that. So. Oh, yes, Director Werb. Um, I think Ms. Meisner is an exemplary example of a teacher. Um, you know, she, she clearly got out of it what she was supposed to, but what happens when there's a teacher that maybe doesn't, and you identify that through this, you know, the QComp, what, what happens then? Right, so with our process, first, a lot of our work, when I mentioned that our, our coaches are really focused on uh, coaching for equity, part of our um, our own collaborative teamwork this year was really emphasized on identifying emotions and resistant teachers and how to question and, and work with them to, to try to get them where they need to go. And part of that is just like we build relationships with our students, we must build relationships with our staff mm -hmm. so that they can look at their biases and possible microaggressions that whether they come up in conversation or in observation. On, on top of that, you know, our observation cycle with 10 year staff is you're working with coaches. You also, in a typical year, will be working with other building leaders. They're also giving you observation feedback. And then every third year, you will be with an administrator. Um, the partnership with a coach is, is really that. Um, and so we strive to get everybody where they need to be. If they get to a place where they're meeting with an administrator and um, they're not moving forward, then it would be the place of the administrator to take kind of the next steps. Thank you. I had one more question too. I just took it is uh, are your coaches and your mentor supports are they people of color too to kind of help since you mentioned equity i just wondered if that would help you know um your transition and your relation as far as talking in language to these students the Absolutely. diverse students we are striving and it is in our um job description and it is in our mou language um, to really uh, seek out teachers of color to serve as coaches. This year we hired three coaches uh, and we didn't have any teachers of color um, apply. So we are continuing, you know, next year we'll have two more coaches enter into the classroom mm -hmm. and we are striving to kind of recruit uh, you know, and that will be our job as current coaches to recruit um, teachers of color to um, to work with us as teachers and and to impact students. Absolutely, just just like our district goal is to hire mm -hmm. more staff um, of color that represents our students. It's our goal to recruit. Awesome, thank you. Yeah. Any questions or comments? No. All right. Thank you, um, Ms. Nuss. Thank you for the presentation and your time for this evening. We will now uh, move to a report about Virtual Academy, our, our new, I <coughs> this is our reference to our new Virtual Academy, um, with Rachel Gordon, Don Leake, Amina Offendel, Stephanie White, and Stacy Sobine as speakers. Uh, Rachel, are you the beginning one? I am, yep. Uh, Welcome. Thank you. Good evening, Chair Miller, Board Directors, and Superintendent Battle. Tonight, my colleagues and I will provide an update to our planning for our virtual academy next year. Next slide, please. We will review the timeline of our application and approval from the Minnesota Department of Education and share our planning around curriculum, professional development, and how we will support students and families in our virtual school. We will provide current enrollment and staffing information and highlight uh, policy implications. Next slide, please. In January, you approved our application to MDE, but our journey to provide an online school started much earlier than that. You could say that it started last August as we visioned out what K-12 education would look like for ISD 191 in the midst of a pandemic and beyond. 
Or you could say our journey started in the 1920 school year when BHS and BAS began hybrid classes that seemed pretty forward thinking at the time. Or you could even say that our journey started in 2015 when our community passed our current technology levy. That's when our entrance into Chromebook, Schoology and utilizing technology for student learning really began. Whichever starting point you choose to embrace, there is no doubt that the groundwork before January is critical to where we are today. Onboarding technology equipment and resources was never about the technology. It has always been about our students and their learning, their experiences and their avenues for success. Our permanent virtual academy launching next fall moves us to the next level in our goal to provide online high quality and flexible learning opportunities for all students. I'll now hand it over to Don Leak, who is our principal responsible for overseeing the Virtual Academy, who will share efforts around ongoing planning and development. Next slide, thank you. Um, the, the journey this year has been uh, one of uh, fast paced and a high level of learning by, by staff and our students. And I think that the things that we take away um, are just exactly how far we have gone with our technology use and how much the kids have learned how to do this. And um, a great example is that kindergartners learning how to raise their hand virtually online and utilize those tools. I think that our, our, our big piece for the, for the coming year is going to be building on our successes of this year and expanding some of the things that we are doing. Um, it's going to be a, a great, a great school year for us. Um, I'm very, very excited about the opportunity to lead this part of this program for the coming school year. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Amina Afdal, the Director of Curriculum Instruction and Professional Development. Thank you, Don. Um, I wanted to just share kind of a picture of what uh, the progression through our K, our, our K through 12 um, uh, virtual academy will look like. First of all, the district curriculum and our instructional resources are all ones that are vetted through the school district and uh, will be uh, um, created and uh, developed in-house by our teachers and uh, using our curriculum review process. Um, our idea is, is that uh, students, as they, they move or matriculate through the virtual academy, continue to build their independent and self-directed learning skills. Um, that our teachers will uh, begin with uh, elementary. It will look uh, with uh, um, significant portions of their day being synchronous. Uh, that we will look at flexible grouping. And um, in order to uh, really uh, reach across that, we're looking at multi-grade classrooms, a K-1 classroom, a 2-3 classroom, and a 4-5 classroom. Um, with the significant number of, uh, a significant time being synchronous, uh, they, the students will have uh, whole group lessons uh, as a multi-grade group. They will also have small group uh, instruction either as a single grade or in a small group based on their uh, what I need time. Uh, they will have access to the specialist art, music, FIED, uh, digital learning, as well as access to support services. Uh, at middle school, we begin to reduce the amount of synchronous time as we develop and build in their independent learning skills, their problem solving skills. We're really looking for a virtual academy to be a school that is uh, built for students who want to be online, who are excited about online interactions and using technology tools, uh, and who find that uh, having more independence to pace their own learning really uh, appeals to them and, and fills their, um, their uh, success bucket. So uh, students will, in the middle school, will have uh, more asynchronous time. They still will meet daily with the teacher online. They will have whole group instruction as well as small group instruction, as well as individual meeting time uh, with teachers uh, throughout the week. When we move to high school, we reduce the, the synchronous time and all content will be delivered asynchronously. It will be uh, comprehensive in that students will be offered all of the credits that they need if they matriculate through nine through 12, 
for uh, graduation. They also may choose to just uh, engage in virtual academy in a supplemental fashion, picking and choosing individual co courses uh, while remaining on uh, in person for the, the remainder of their course. Uh, they will have uh, individual meetings. They will have face-to-face uh, -face contact with their teacher. Uh, they will be able to self-pace themselves during the week and uh, continue to access uh, support services, whether it be counselors or um, uh, college and career guidance, advisory, all of those will be uh, continued to be available to students at the high school level. Um, for professional development, we're already uh, meeting with uh, our virtual academy elementary teachers to uh, uh, address multi-grade classrooms and uh, organize ourselves in that way and uh, continuing to hone the skills that we've developed over the last 15 months uh, our teachers have um, done an outstanding job all the way from the back beginning with 2015, uh, 16, when uh, Director Gordon was actually looking at, uh, was uh, working on blended learning teams. And so um, all of that is coming to fruition. And um, she has led us uh, to this uh, really great uh, kind of comprehensive plan where we are developing those independent online learners. Next slide. So in order to support the students who are in our virtual academy, we have a variety of, of student support services that we also offer in, our, um, in the rest of our schools. These services include special education and related services, learning English language, social emotional supports, and mental health supports, including our headway therapists. We also have um, the pandemic to continue to consider. Um, this option does provide um, a choice for families who are easing their way and navigating um, the next few months and how, the, um, how COVID affects their family. Um, in that way, we will also continue to um, provide them health services and um, and support um, any questions around the health and safety of their family. Next slide. That one turns to me here. Um, as of May 18th, we currently have 313 students enrolled in K-12. Uh, elementary has 123, which would justify the reallocation of six FTEs to maintain class sizes aligned with our class sizes in our um, on-site or in the buildings. Uh, we have 71 students enrolled six through eight. Uh, we would be looking to supplement that um, middle school area, um, primarily looking at our lingering COVID needs for students that and families that may still wanna do distance learning through this process as we kind of gain some momentum. And we have 119 students with grades 9 through 12. So those FTEs will be reallocated from the high school based upon enrollment as well as course selection. So different courses have a number of students in which they would use to determine if that course will run. And they will have to look at the needs of the students and what they're looking for. And then if we need to, we would reallocate like a 0.2 FTE for science or for art or whatever, the different areas. So that's going to, the high school is going to be based more upon registration as well as enrollment, a combination of both. One of the other things that we did was uh, really take a look at our district policies and consider the implications of the online school to our district policies. Uh, specifically, we did review uh, policy 503, uh, 509.5, and 602, really taking a look at uh, some um, very minor changes in language and uh, uh, creating the opportunity for virtual academy to be included into the policies. The core of the policies do not change. We simply try to uh, create more inclusive language. These uh, proposed changes will go before the um, school board policy review committee in June. Next slide. 
with that, I really want to thank you all for uh, giving us this opportunity. I do also want to uh, make sure that uh, you recognize just the advantage uh, for the school district when so many districts, as uh, Director Gordon said, um, are not able to offer um, a virtual opportunity due to due to the um, changes in the executive orders. Um, and uh, that sets us apart uh, to some of our neighbors, allowing our families who continue to be concerned about COVID to have that opportunity mm -hmm. to stay in our district, as well as um, creating a very innovative space for um, uh, folks from families from other districts who are no longer able to access an online mm -hmm. opportunity. So, thank you. Thank you to all of you that uh, presentation, uh, board members, questions and or comments. Hey, that one. What is um, with the current um, potential enrollment for the fall at 313, what is that in comparison to where we're at currently virtual academy members? Like are, are, are some are many of the families who are currently in virtual academy renewing for next fall? Are, are many of our current distance learning students re-enrolling for this fall in virtual academy? Is that the question? Yes. I don't have that breakdown as to where they're enrolled for this year compared to next year. Um, we, we do have it broken down by the buildings as to where folks are enrolling from. Um, and it's, it's pretty much across the board, evenly across the board as to where they're coming from. So. And currently with the students in Virtual Academy, what are our numbers like right now for those that are still in Virtual Academy now in comparison to the fall? Are we seeing like, are we seeing an increase for the fall, a decrease? It, it definitely will be a decrease. I mean, we're, we're, we're right now close to, I'm thinking around 25% of our population is online. Okay. And Director this, Chester, I think Don Leak, the last time we spoke, maybe two weeks ago, was it 2,900? Yeah, as of two weeks ago, it was about 2,900 students that were still in virtual academy this school year. Yeah. So okay. it's a it's a significant uh, decline. Yeah. Yep. Other questions or comments? So uh, every year we do a, what's called an annual transfer request, okay, and that opens up in December and is usually open for about a month and a half. At the time, we included Virtual Academy because we were right in the midst of that process and we wanted to make sure just to get an interest or get a feel of how many staff might be interested in doing it. We actually had a large amount of turn folks interested. At the time, um, a lot of the folks that were interested probably had the, the idea that COVID would still be really a major player come this fall and next year, okay? Once we started then getting the numbers from the families as far as those interested in enrolling, then it became clear, especially at the elementary, that we would need to do a multi-grade approach to, to be efficient and to make this work. With that, um, we actually reposted for elementary for virtual academy because all of the folks that applied or said they were interested in, in January, the principals felt that it was important to make sure that they understood mm -hmm. this is going to be multi-grade. Mm -hmm. And it's, you know, we had a little bit more idea of what the makeup would be. So at that point, people applied, principals interviewed, that's how they were selected at the elementary level. Um, middle school and high school will be a little bit different because it'll be based upon licensure. So we'll still seek volunteers. We have contract language that seeks volunteers to take these positions. If no one would volunteer, then we would look at the least senior person that's licensed in that department. And so that's how we'll kind of approach that. And are we anticipating that the teachers will be full-time virtual academy or might they be doing some of both? Elementary will be full-time. 
Um, the three FTEs that we looked at for the middle school, um, that is going to be, that's going to be have to yet to be determined based upon licensure and what we can acquire. So if we can find somebody that has a math and a science license, somebody that has social studies and an English license, people with uh, elementary license for sixth grade, you might be able to get away with three full-time folks, okay? If we're not able to find that flexibility, then we may have to do a little bit of um, point fives to kind of round it out. High school will be, again, based upon the courses that are selected and offered. So that will, they won't be full-time folks, they more than likely will be .2 increments as to the number of courses they're teaching or comparative. I wanna be careful because I think the, the virtual academy at the high school is gonna be more of a block approach. So it isn't necessarily gonna to equate to a perfect .2. Okay, thanks. Um, is there a date we're gonna close enrollment or are we just gonna to continue to allow people to enroll at any given point, like during the school year? Well, I, at, at this point in time, I don't anticipate that we're gonna close enrollment during the summer, okay? So once folks are in um, and we're able to determine what our needs are going forward, we're gonna probably run with that. Any of the other grades, any of the other buildings I have trend data, I can pretty much show you what to expect. This is new. So I wouldn't wanna close it off too soon because then we're running inefficient programming. So we're going to try to maximize and create as many opportunities for our families as possible for as long as we can. What about the flip side of that? If somebody is currently signed up for virtual academy and changes their mind in July? You, um, now we're outside of enrollment or from my standpoint. So those may be more questions that I'm going to direct towards uh, the other folks mm -hmm. on the team. Thank you for your question, Director Hume and members of the board. So um, Director Altadal mentioned that um, one of the advantages of us being approved for an online provider is that uh, some districts have a demand from their families for a distance learning and they don't have the authorization. And so we have already received some inquiries um, so within the statute and the application process, you can have uh, a partnership with another district where they really would like to say, we'd like to send our students to your online. Mm -hmm. Or as you know, student can and family can make a choice. And so I don't know if Amina or Rachel wanna talk a little bit about that, um, but then the opposite of what happens, yeah, that's the, unknown territory. So we do ask for a commitment for a year because planning and staffing, and so we're learning from our partners with that. Um, so that is one of the areas that we are concerned about. So I don't know if Amina, Don, or Rachel want to add to my comments. I'll just uh, add one thing, Superintendent Battle, which is, yep, we know that there are going to be some families, um, as with any variance into outside of someone's uh, resident uh, assigned school, and um, that for whatever reasons, their circumstances change, and they will need to uh, ask for uh, the variance uh, to be removed and to be reassigned back to their resident school. Um, they do have a space in their resident school. Um, we would do, we would handle this in the same way that we would handle any school change. Um, we would really want to get to the root of the, uh, of the concern and do what is best for the success of the student um, and have that at, on a very individual basis in conversations with the family and the principal. Principal Lee. Thank you. A um, couple questions, and Amina or Brian, I'm not sure which one of you would take this one. Coming off of the, the pro pay discussion, I'm wondering about have we, are we calibrating 
observations for the virtual academy? What's, where are we with that? Mm -hmm. um, we have, um, even beginning last spring when we moved into distance learning for the first time, the um, Katie and uh, Jennifer Bohr, who was the coordinator at that time, really were working on uh, recalibrating and providing guidance to uh, the, the CICs, the coaches as, that were doing observations and the principals who were doing evaluations on indicators of, of high quality instruction aligned to the Danielson framework for teaching um, in a virtual environment. And uh, so we did create a, a document and distribute that. And I just wanna compliment the, the continuous improvement coaches for taking the lead on that and really guiding folks. They continue to refine it this year and uh, to provide support and feedback to teachers on their virtual classroom. And so we will continue to refine that. Uh, but I feel as though the bulk of that work has been done. Um, we used a lot of the um, guidance from uh, Director Gordon's blended learning cohort, um, best practices, and the work of uh, Caitlin Tucker on uh, effective practices for uh, virtual learning. Great, thank you. I didn't know that, that's great. <laughs> um, these are kind of all over the place, my questions. Um, so. I'm not sure where I where I read this or saw it, but I'm aware that, you know, in a virtual setting, teachers um, have been concerned about the social emotional health of their students and not being able to do the check ins with them in the same way that they do in the classroom. How do we manage that K-12, given that, you know, secondary is going to be mostly asynchronous? Um. Although the, the bulk of the content instruction will be asynchronous, teachers will have expectations for um, ongoing regular contact with students um, and creating opportunities for students to work together uh, to build collaboration that is part of best practice in, in learning and the innovation that comes with working in uh, technology-based uh, industry is being able to collaborate as many of us have learned to do in a virtual environment and utilizing those tools. Um, all levels will continue to have advisory and will continue to have um, social emotional learning curriculum that will be delivered. Awesome, thank you. Um... And then for the students that are um, doing the one-off classes, you know, there there are in-person students that maybe want to get that extra, you know, credit. Um, will they simply be sitting in a supervised study hall for those classes? What what will that look like for them? Um, that will look exactly as it looks like for our students who are on PSEO for um, uh, one or two classes rather than full-time PSEO, where we provide a space usually in the media center that is uh, supervised for them to uh, connect and do their work. Okay, thank you. And then um, thinking about the reports that this board receives, um, I imagine you'll be talking about whether to report on the virtual academy separately in the dash, like talking about the enrollment report that we receive and you know the different the different um, looking at the the health and wellness of our schools virtual academy will be added to that that list right virtual academy has been established as a separate school so we have a separate uh, k-8 school and a separate 912 school so so it, that right no help me out we have, we, have three, we, have, we have k-5 <laughs> six eight and nine twelve so then at each of those levels, you know, imagining hypothetically that we get back to having principal reports on the schools, then we would have three additional reports, um, one for elementary, one for middle school, and one for high school. Uh, don't want to speak for data, The data would be able to, we'd be able to separate the data that way, yes. Okay, awesome. Uh, and that was it, thank you. Excellent. Any other? Um, remind yeah. me, how are we doing outreach with families that are not in our district? How are we getting those families in? I can take this one. Um, 
We're not doing a significant amount of outreach at this time because the time uh, timeline in order to get our virtual academy up and running, uh, we're really focusing it on ensuring that we're providing the best experience possible. But we haven't done a lot of outreach other than what Dr. Battle was talking about is that uh, we are in discussion with other districts who don't have the opportunity to provide a virtual academy. Okay. Thank you. Um, the, other, the other piece that's gonna be happening is um, the Department of Education um, creates a list of online schools. And within those lists, all of our courses that we will be offering online this year will be included for anyone in the state of Minnesota to uh, tap into. Great. To, to address your question, one of the, we received an inquiry earlier this week for enrollment. Um, actually, that was international. <laughs> And uh, the rules are, though, you have to be a student in the state of Minnesota, okay? So we had to turn that down. But the connection was this was a family who moved overseas. That was a part of 191 and wanted to continue their experience with the district. So this may open up a different type of an avenue for the district when job relocation, different things along that line, if families uh, appreciate the experience that they're receiving here, mm -hmm. may choose our virtual academy to continue here. Wasn't really anticipated, mm -hmm. but we hope that may play out as well. So directors, uh, to add on to that, there is a MDE has a working group looking at this statute because the experience of the pandemic has opened eyes to new ways of offering learning. Mm -hmm. And so um, we'll see if there's a presentation the next legisla uh, legislative session, mm -hmm. but it, it, it's known and people believe learning doesn't just happen inside four walls anymore. Mm -hmm. So, we're excited to see where this goes. The demand is very different now, and people realize there are different ways to structure learning environments. Mm -hmm. And then also to even out the student distribution, like say for instance, if just to keep the program growing, you had a smaller amount in, her, in Amina's presentation of um, middle school students. So would you ever consider going six through nine to kind of level it out so you wouldn't have so many high school students as a, and then so um, <clears throat> so many less middle school students? I mean, if that were the case next fall. There actually will be opportunities for students in, um, in middle school to take courses um, with high school students virtually, or oh. to take the high school courses and earn high school credit. Uh, examples of that would be things like uh, geometry, or uh, like an advanced math or Spanish language or so there the more of those connections that we can make uh, allows our virtual academy to be a, a, a different kind of offering for our middle school students. Well, that's awesome. And so, Director Connor, to know, uh, I think it was 2006 or seven when I was a junior high principal, we had two eighth graders that were taking high school courses and one was enrolled in the University of Minnesota because they were so advanced in math. So we've always been able to accelerate kids in Minnesota. Mm -hmm. so. But I'm not sure if it's that. Good to know. The question is exclusively for accelerated students. It's more like yeah. if the enrollment is, what's the minimum mm -hmm. enrollment before you determine whether or not that class exists? Yes, and so that's where the multi-grade concept so uh that part of the question looking can we look at a different grade configuration possibly one, one of and the i think the multi-grade too will occur at the middle school level not necessarily in the core but it will in the electives where they're looking at multi-grade courses for that rotate from year to year um rather than um students having a sixth grade uh digital learning class, a seventh grade digital learning class, and an eighth grade digital learning class, there'll be a six through eight class. And um, they'll be able to deliver that uh, curriculum to those kids together. I was just going to mention, we have trend data on a lot of our school's grades and everything over the past few years. For the next couple of years, all of our data for both within our buildings as well as our virtual academy 
is going to um, probably be more of an anomaly with the COVID experience. So hard, fast decisions for the next couple of years, you're, you, there's going to be an awful lot of variables at play here that we're just going to have to kind of sift through. And some of the stuff, we may have to let it play itself out to see where the trend really is going. It'll be kind of like when the when they change the test and we'll have to have asterisks. For it's a reset. Just to remember. <laughs> yep. Yep. Um, John Leake, I wanted to follow up on a question or a statement you made about um, being registered with the uh, MDE and then having, uh, I think you alluded to students taking classes. To clarify, so, because um, or maybe you just alluded to them listing our classes. Um, so students would be able to uh, just take a class or two, maybe they're in a virtual environment somewhere else, but they like a class that's being offered at the Burnsville High School, they could take, or Burnsville Virtual Program, they could take that class, or do they have to fully enroll in our programming to, uh, to take classes here? Oh, we have, um, we have two components of our program. It's a comprehensive program on one part, um, and then it's also a supplemental program especially at the 912 level. And what, what the MDE puts together is, is it allows for families to look at different programs and different classes. And yes, um, we do dual enrollments all the time currently. And so we, a student that lives in uh, Bemidji could be taking um, three classes at their high school and they could come to the Art Virtual Academy and take two more, Interesting. let's say. So um, it, it it, yeah, no, I understood the, the supplemental. behind all this, yeah. I understood the supplemental. I guess I envisioned it more, um, you know, a student at our, high, at our high school would be wanting to take a couple classes virtually because they're available, maybe not that quarter available or semester available in the regular high school. But interesting, so that Bemidji student um, in, under MDE rules, I'm straying a little out of the conversation, but could they take a class virtually here, a couple classes at their high school and a class virtually at Lakeville's program also if they wanted to? Is that is that within the Absolutely, boundaries? Absolutely, yes. Oh, interesting, okay. So, and and for, for your other part, we do have 50 students from the high school, 50 or so students at the high school looking to take a, be a supplemental, uh, be part of the supplemental program for the virtual academy. Um, don't have all that nailed down yet, but we have some interest out there. How does the funding from the other districts come in to support? Yeah, the how does funding work in that class? environment? Are they by class <laughs> or? That, it, that's, that's that MARS um, and enrollment data that mm -hmm. I am, I, I understand very little other than that's where I, where I know it all comes from and that's what drives the funding. Yeah. Uh, Rachel, we just had a conversation earlier about this your average daily membership. Rachel, do you want to explain that? Or Stacy? <laughs> it's very, a little complex. Well, that, that's or really what it kind of comes down right. to is the average daily membership. You know, so if a student is with us for the full year, takes a full course load, that'd be like a 1.0, okay? So if somebody is with us taking two courses for the entire year, that portion would then also, the funding would follow us, follow to us. Is, so the interesting, is the simple answer on that. Yeah, the interesting, so it's a little bit like credit hours, I mean, sort of, but the interesting part of that is, um, if I'm hearing you right, uh, at the end of the day, an hour class or two hour class here costs the same as an hour class, two hour class at any other district in the state of Minnesota, right? It, it, I don't know, there might look, but essentially for the time period, there's a there's um, a finite amount of money per student, right? And and, and, and the, the my my pause on that is, and this actually now gets to become more of a Lisa question, who wasn't a part of this. Yeah, was <laughs> is that part of the ADM only the state funded portion, or does our local levy get attached to it, or the levy portion at the district in which they're coming from follow the student? I don't know that piece of it, so minimum. Yeah. State funding would fall. But nuances aside, if we yes. zoomed out a lot of these for a second, that's interesting, just a, a little take on it, that there isn't really any kind of pricing um, war that can happen among districts, uh, given that, at least as long as they continue that model. Um, all right, so I, I have a couple comments. It, 
Uh, I appreciated uh, Director Gordon's intro uh, about the, the perspective on when this started, the, the standing on shoulders of giants uh, commentary, basically, and that's helpful to understand how hard we work to get to where we are. Um, <clears throat> it is very important to me that we make a very clear delineation that this is coincidentally following and it is very helped by the, the learning lessons that we learned from COVID. But this is not a COVID virtual academy going forward in the fall. This is a new school. And I think when we look through those lenses, we start answering some of the questions I heard here tonight. Uh, you know, Director Hume, for instance, the average student that I foresee, sort of the demographic of the, uh, you know, the, of the average student there is very different from one that would be taking virtual you know, lessons right now. So for instance, across the street from where I live, there's a young man um, who is currently on the United States school, uh, snowboarding Olympic team. And so as such, he's enrolled at the Lake Virtual Academy at Lakeville because he spends a couple of months out of the year or here and there in Switzerland training. And he just simply can't be in school. Or maybe, you know, you have a family where the students, the, 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 the parents decided to buy a sailboat and sail around the world for a year to give their kids that experience, but they want to come back and graduate from high school at Burnsville. Um, or a child that needs to be in uh, dialysis, you know, three, four times a week for three, four hours at a time, simply just cannot be in school and needs to do something. So those are the kind of demographics I'm thinking of when I think about this. Uh, you know, and, and so my gut feeling is we're not going to have a lot of in and out in that environment. They're going to be in for a reason. Um, I mean, it might happen, but, you know. But I would like us to continue to think that way. So to me, honestly, the inquiry you had was not too unusual. That, that would be... You know, yeah, we, we had, maybe maybe they're overseas because you know one of the parents took a job for two years at the, you know, in a station and is planning on coming back. They kept their house. They want to continue in the district. Um, those are the kind of things I you know I foresee as the kind of students. So I'd encourage us to continue to use that mentality as we move forward and build this out, um, and 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 hopefully eventually where it people are coming from around the state of Minnesota because there's a program down there in Burnsville that I can't get in Bemidji or I can't get where else, and that's my access into it. Um, because, you know, as much as we, COVID's gonna go away and, and we all have very short-term memories, unfortunately, it will be a thing of the past here in a year or two, and this will be growing and expanding in my, in my hopes. Um, but as far as growing and expanding, one thing I think this presentation did not have that we should, probably should have had in there is uh, something to touch on the marketing and communications that's uh, in plan. So that's I think what we will need to we, is probably there enough to talk about that we should plan on that in the semi near future is a presentation just about that. Um, so we'll put that on the agenda um, because, uh, you know, if you are looking at it as something more than a stop gap to, gap to something and it, and it is a shiny new thing that we're rolling out mm -hmm. um, that we built back in the lab and now we're bringing out to the public, we need to know how we're going to sell it and, and how it's going to be out there. So. Let's, let's plan on that, Dr. Brown. Okay. Good. I was just going to mention that, and you took the words right out of my mouth. I was going to say, well, what about some type of marketing? Okay. Good. Yes. Good. All right. Well, um, that leads us to the next and last item on our uh, information agenda tonight, and that would be to receive an update about District 191's efforts to implement COVID-19 related educational and public health guidance issued by the MD and the MDH, respectively. So although I said we're gonna get out from under, we still have things to talk about, so Dr. Battle. Thank you, Chair Miller, directors of the board. Tonight, Bernie Bean and I will share information related to health and safety and updated guidance from the Minnesota Department of Education and the Minnesota Department of Health. So first I begin with our county updates um, from the Minnesota Department of Health. The uh, confirmed cases of COVID-19 represent the time period from May 2nd through May 15th. Dakota County is 27.93, representing a decrease from 40.70. Scott County is 27.97, representing a decrease from 42.34. Uh, now I'll turn it over to Bernie Bean, and then after she concludes, I will come back with some more updated guidance from MDE and MDH. Thank you, Dr. Battle. Good evening, Chair Miller and Board of Directors. For that time frame for the 14-day, which was the May 2nd to the May 15th, 
In our district, um, health services completed six case investigations for individuals that were positive in our building. Just for a reference, the time frame before that, we had completed 17 case investigations. The next time frame, which will be May 9th to May 22nd, we will have completed three investigations. Um, and currently this week, we have completed zero investigations for individuals that have been positive in our buildings. Um, both Dakota, Dakota County does predict a decrease in their 14 day rate for next week. And actually it will be a rate that um, we have not seen since August. And so that's all really good, exciting news. As far as the positivity rates, Minnesota has decreased from 4.6 to 3.8. Dakota County has decreased from 5.3 to 5 to 4.0, and Scott County has decreased from 5.5 to 4.1. Um, we are starting to see the spring surge coming to a halt. The seven-day rate for Dakota County ha has decreased to 37, where last week it was 64 positive cases in a day. Um, they have not seen a 37 rate since July 8th of last year. This is the 13th day that they have been below 100 and the third day that that rate has been below 50. As we know with any surge, the last things to change are the hospitalizations and the death rate. We are now starting to see a decrease in the hospitalizations, which will lead to seeing more deaths um, due to COVID. This week, um, Dakota County has seen seven deaths, and those individuals have all been under the age of 70. That is a little increase from the prior, prior week, which was three. Vaccinations continues to be one of our strongest mitigation strategies. Last week, Pfizer um, was authorized an emergency use license for our 12 to 15 year olds. Dakota County started offering the vaccination to that age group last week. Um, out of the 3,000, approximately 3,000 residents in Dakota County in that age group, they were able to vaccinate 10% of that student population. So that shows a great um, community effort to keep our kids safe. Um, as far as rates for vaccination, in Minnesota, the vaccination coverage for 16 and up is at 64%. For Dakota County, it is at almost 68%. They predict by next week that vaccination coverage rate in Dakota County will be at 70%. Um, we continue to do our saliva screening for staff and students. Um, the optional program. Um, we just completed it on Monday and the last screening will be conducted on June 7th. And that concludes my information. Thank you. Thank you, Bernie. I'll add a little bit of more information from Scott County's public health meeting for Scott County superintendents today from Lisa Brodsky. Scott County has 66% of 16 and ages uh, up vaccinated and 65 years and up 95%. So now on to the Minnesota Department of Education and Minnesota Department of Health uh, guidance. So all public school districts and charter schools must follow the safe learning plan until the last teacher contact day for each individual district or charter school. For us, most students, it is June 10th, but our last day is June 11th for our seniors when we will have graduation. So beginning immediately after the last teacher contact day, school districts and charter schools will follow the state's COVID-19 recommendations for summer programming. These recommendations will continue to be updated. In reference to the summer program, we are to use the state recommendations as a guide and schools will need to make decisions about how to handle the following at the local level. Face coverings, physical distancing, contact tracing, quarantining, student and staff COVID-19 testing, meal times, and any other special areas. I previously mentioned we have um, 
The second week of June, we have our graduation celebrations with the last um, on June 11th. There is specific guidance for districts and charter schools who have graduations beginning May 28th, which is tomorrow. We must follow the universal guidance for all businesses and entities. So this puts us in the same category as the AIM Center. And so we're moving from the safe learning plan into a different uh, universal guidance. There was a change in this guidance um, that is very uh, specific that we need to account for for our June 11th graduation. Previously, it was required that any outdoor graduations of 500 uh, uh, participants, uh, it would be required to wear face masks. They have changed um, that our guests, it is now only recommended, not required. Please remember our students will still be under the safe uh, learning plan, and so we are requiring that those students participating in graduation our students uh, will be wearing masks. Also, uh, CDC will update, the, will update its guidance for schools in the coming weeks, and then our state will also update its guidance for the opening of schools in the fall. And with that, that concludes our report for tonight. Any questions or comments for Dr. Battle on the report? Uh, just one, and I'm sure, uh, Dr. Battle, you're, um, <laughs> you're gathering all this guidance as it comes in and continues to come in. Um, I would just ask, uh, you know, that there be, uh, continue to be clear communication around expectations for people in our schools and in our buildings, and most specifically for a committee that might meet the Monday after um, graduation, <laughs> just so we know what to expect. Yes, <laughs> yes. So more changes to come. Thank you. The more communication. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Battle. And I'll just add, it, you know, the, the graduation thing has been a tricky wicket to uh, navigate um, for all those involved. Thank you for your hard work on it. Um, uh, for the general public that might ap actually happen to watch this, um, you know, again, it, it, the mask wearing is recommended. Um, those of us that are participating in the event will be wearing masks. We would ask you please to mm -hmm. use your common sense and um, think about how important the day that is for the district and for the students there versus a couple of hours of potential slight in discomfort for you to wear a mask. So those of you who can do it, please do wear a mask. It'd be very well appreciated. Thank you. All uh, right, uh, I, I spoke out of turn. We do have one more item on information. We have committee board appointment and school assignment reports. I'll start with the committee reports. Just go round table here, policy committee. Yep, um, policy committee met Monday, May 17th. Several policies are coming forward tonight from that meeting. We can continue the committee's review of policy 634, electronic technologies acceptable use. This is a new policy which will replace policy 524, internet acceptable use and safety policy. As a more lengthy policy, um, and given the shift in committee membership, um, it's moving slowly through the review process. Um, at this point in time, as discussed, you know, current guidelines would lead us to think that perhaps our meeting on Monday, June 14th at 5.30 here at, would be here at Diamond Head, but we will, we will await to, to hear confirmation from that. Um, and that concludes my report. Thank you. Legislative Committee. Yeah. Uh, the Legislative Committee met on Tuesday, May 11th. Uh, we met with uh, Representative Liz Ryer, um, and it's wonderful to have such uh, committed legislators um, that advocate on our behalf and support our students in our district. It was a wonderful meeting with her. And as a result of some of our conversations, you heard in the presentation from Lisa on open facilities that the guidance is, is that when we want to move forward with our legislative agenda with bills that we should start engaging with our legislators in October. So that is the plan. Excellent. Thank you. And negotiations. The district is currently in negotiations with two bargaining units, uh, custodial and the BEA. With regard to BEA negotiations, the teams met Tuesday, May 18th and Monday, May 24th. 
our discussions have been productive. The teams are scheduled to meet next Monday, June 21st from six, oh no. Not next Monday. Not next Monday. Monday, June 21st from 6 to 8 p.m. here at Diamond Head in the Burnsville room. Okay. I'm speeding too fast. Excellent, okay. Uh, that covers committees. We'll now move to board appointments. Um, before I just throw it open for that, uh, Director Werb, this would be the point where we have an input on the insurance thing. Uh, I imagine you have not had a chance to do much with that yet. Uh, but if you wanted to just speak a few, are, do, you have, do you have anything to say about it? Or? We're trying to get a meeting scheduled. Excellent. All right, perfect. Thank you. <laughs> uh, so any other board assignments? Yes, Director uh, Chester, go ahead. Yep, uh, so uh, ISD 917 met on May, June the 4th. Um, they are recognizing um, two of their employees of the year. One is the licensed employee, which was the licensed school nurse, uh, Melissa Ho. And then um, the other one, other um, person of the year was a first grade classroom individual, um, Kirsten Lazzarardi, Lazzaretti. Um, and then they also passed a few um, motions regarding um, some policies and in addition uh, passed a resolution approving uh, the lease levies, uh, safe school levy and LTFM long-term facilities maintenance plan, uh, 10 year plan. They also had a resolution passed approving ISD 917's long-term facilities maintenance program budget. All right, thank you. Um, yes, in the uh, AMSD, um, that's okay. It's not a um, all right, this is from April 10th because I forgot my report for last month. And this month in May, I was going to attend the meeting, but it said board of directors for AMSD. So I'm not a board of directors, so I kind of got out of that one. But anyway, but some interesting facts came out of the April meeting that I believe was not in the um, online presentation in their website. Uh, there was no increase in the basic funding formula for um, cross subsidies. I don't know if you knew that or not, but I'm just, uh, so subsidies, subsidies in special education, um, but they did approve new education savings account program and direct funding to the non-public schools for safe, um, for safe schools aid and the guidance and counseling department of the schools. So I don't know if anyone knew that, but I thought that was kind of interesting that they kind of cut funding, but then they slipped another program in there. And then also they gave um, some graphics on Minnesota, some graphs, I'm sorry, on Minnesota surveys. And um, it all had to do with um, percentages of how our distance learning was going in the schools uh, during COVID. And, they, and I'll just give you some of these. I thought they were pretty interesting. 61% of um, kids still wanted to go to school. They did not like the distance learning. 58% think Minnesota systems were good though. 42% uh, favor online learning. And this was, uh, surveys were with students and parents. 67% uh, still concerned about um, the health of their students. And they were just concerned about hybrid learning altogether. And this was also just for the metro. They, they did some that was uh, outside this, our district and that some that were just the metro. So that's kind of both. 68% uh, um, oh, of education was done um, during distance learning at one point during the year. Uh, I didn't get the Pacific um, months. 38% were concerned about um, student teacher safety so COVID safety in the schools, 80% of students need a teacher for social interaction. So this posed that technology is not gonna be taking over in the near future without some guidance. So we won't just be seeing online learning as a solution for futures at this time in elementary school is what their conclusion was. So I thought that was interesting. Very good, thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other board appointment or school assignment reports? I have a very brief update if I may. The Burnsville High School Hall of Fame Committee had its most recent meeting last Wednesday, May the 19th, where we reviewed the nominations for the Hall of Fame class of fall of 2021. 
and an announcement will be forthcoming about who was selected and when they will be recognized. But it was a very good meeting, and that concludes my report. Thank you. Any others? Okay, very good. Now we are done with the information section of our meeting tonight. We will move into the business meeting, uh, beginning with our consent agenda. Although board action is required, it is generally unnecessary to hold discussion on these items. In the event a board member wishes to discuss an item, that item will be moved for separate consideration. This time I'll ask if there's any items on the consent agenda that board members wish to remove for separate consideration. Seeing none, I will then ask for a motion to approve tonight's consent agenda. So moved. Uh, moved by Director Alt and a second, please. Second. Seconded by Director Hume. Ms. Kenny, will you please call the roll? Ms. Kenny, are you available to call the roll? Maybe she's on mute. Uh, oh, she's on, oh, there sorry. she is. Wait. Oh. Her mic's not working. Can you hear me now? Yes, yes. you can. <laughs> <laughs> you knew it. <laughs> Why am I? Yeah, that's odd. Okay, Connor? Aye. Chester? Aye. Miller? Aye. Alt? Aye. Saeed? Aye. Werb? Aye. Hume? Aye. Excellent. The motion to approve tonight's consent agenda passes unanimously. Moving then to the new business section of our meeting tonight, we will begin with uh, the to approve reinstatement of elementary activities. Speaking on this act, uh, recommendation is Brian Gersich, Assistant Superintendent. Thank you. Uh, good evening, Chair Miller, Superintendent Battle, and Board of Directors. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to bring this forward at this time. Uh, the purpose is, again, we're proposing action to reinstate four elementary activities, uh, as was presented in greater detail at the May 13th board meeting, uh, certainly on behalf of Principal Brad Robb, uh, Director uh, Amina Oftedal and myself, we appreciated the time, the questions, uh, and the great discussion that we had at that meeting to learn more about this proposal and policy. Uh, as noted in the original proposal, it's our elementary principals who are really seeking to reinstate this and primarily to uh, secure this through Title IV funding, which should be able to sustain these programs both now and into the future and without displacing other programs and positions to be able to do that, as again was outlined by Director Oftedal at the May 13th board meeting. So as a result, it is our recommendation that the Board of Education approve the reinstatement of elementary activities Technology Club, Student Council, Peer Leaders, and State, I'm sorry, not State Fair, Science Fair, starting the 2021-2022 school year. All right, may I have a, a motion, please, for the recommendation in front of us? So moved. Moved by Director Chester. Second. Second by Director Saeed. Uh, I will now open it up for questions or any discussion. All right. Seeing none, Ms. Kenny, will you please call the roll? Yes, can you hear me? Yes. yes. <laughs> Chester. Aye. Miller. Aye. Alt. Aye. Saeed. Aye. Werb. Aye. Hume. Aye. Connor. Aye. The motion to approve reinstatement of elementary activities passes unanimously. Very good. Uh, now we will move to a next recommendation to approve the strategic plan, vision statement, and core values. Uh, speaker on this topic is Dr. Teresa Battle, Superintendent, and Aaron Tinkelberg, Director of Communications. Thank you, Chair Miller, Directors of the Board. Tonight we will bring you the final version of uh, the vision statement and core values. I do want to thank you as well as all of the constituents who uh, provided information that led to these, uh, the final recommendation. And Aaron Tinklenberg will tell you about a slight change from the last time we presented uh, based on your feedback. Um, and so he'll share that and then I'll read the recommendation. 
Uh, thank you, Chair Miller, uh, Dr. Battle, and members of the board. Um, so before you, you have the uh, revised and, and uh, recommended version of the District 191 vision statement and core values. Um, as you can see, the vision statement uh, that we're going, that we're recommending is the uh, bulleted version that uh, this board uh, preferred. And under core values, uh, most of them are about the same as what you had seen two weeks ago. The difference is uh, what had been intentional agency, we uh, adjusted to student agency. As hard as we tried, we couldn't think of a word that encapsulated what we mean by agency better than agency. Uh, but by clarifying and simplifying whose agency we're talking about, we hope that'll be clearer for the public and for uh, members of our community in general. The description's still there and, and uh, hopefully that uh, brings, things, brings things clearly through. And with that, I bring forward a recommendation that the Board of Education adopt the proposed vision statement and core values to replace the current language as part of the District 191 strategic roadmap and update the roadmap title to remove reference to the years 2015 to 2020. May I have a motion for the recommendation in front of us? So moved. Oh, go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> moved by uh, Director Hume, seconded by Director Chester. I will open it up for any discussion or comments on the motion in front of us. Seeing none, Ms. Kenny, will you please call the roll? Miller? Aye. Ong? Aye. Saeed? Aye. Werb? Aye. Hume? Aye. Connor? Aye. Chester? Aye. The motion to approve the strategic plan, vision statement, and core values passes unanimously. Next item is uh, and a recommendation on the release of classified staff. Speaker tonight for that subject will be Stacy Sobine, Executive Director of Human Resources. Good evening again. Um, earlier this spring, we went through and released our certified staff, our licensed staff, uh, again as part of uh, either right-sizing annual process for long-term subs and such. Um, at this point, we're at the place where we now release our, our classified staff. We really don't have uh, much in the way of a lot of individuals, and the, the amount is for roughly about an hour, half an hour, two hours. Uh, the one that is different is the middle school. Uh, the, for Nicollet, we are actually sunsetting that position. We still had a level three EA there, but we don't have level three EAs at the middle school or the high school. This was a carryover from last year from Metcalf that went to Nicollet. So that was intentional. We were moving towards that anyway. Um, so well, I'll bring to you the recommendation. Uh, it is the recommendation that the Board of Education adopt the following resolution, be it resolved, by the Board of Education of Independent School District 191 that the following classified personnel are hereby laid off from their positions effective 6-10-2021. Be it further resolved that written notice is sent to said, oh, should be said as uh, employees regarding termination and non-renewal of his or her contract as provided by law. All right. Um, do we need to modify it if there's a, if there's a typo? I, as read as by employees. Okay. All right. Um, I will take a, uh, a motion for the recommendation in front of us. So moved. moved by Director Connor. Second, please. Second. <laughs> Seconded by Director Werb. Uh, any comments or uh, questions for uh, Stacey Swobine? Not seeing any. Uh, Ms. Kenny, will you please call the roll? Alt? Aye. Saeed? Aye. Werb? Aye. Hume? Aye. Connor? Aye. Chester? Aye. Miller? Aye. The motion to release of or for release of classified staff uh, as read mm. uh, passes unanimously. Next uh, recommendation on the agenda is to, for the approval of a replacement purchase of classroom panels. 
Presenting on this topic will be Rachel Gordon, Director of Technology. Thank you. Good evening again. Um, tonight I'm bringing forward a recommendation to approve the purchase of replacement interactive panels for our elementary schools. Just a little background is that this has been um, over a four year process to evaluate um, how we were going to replace the existing smart boards in our classrooms. Um, it started with an elementary technology steering committee back four years ago. Um, and we were set to move forward with this actually in the spring of 2019 when the COVID pandemic started. And so everything kind of got put on hold, including the funding was uh, set aside for this. Um, we revitalized the process this spring um, and uh, took a look at what uh, was going to be changing in our classrooms as far as technology needs uh, with the experiences that we've had over the last 15 months. And we feel like we've landed on a very good solution with a um, new line true touch interactive display. It looks very similar to a smart board. It's not smart um, branded and it has some additional modern features uh, for casting and how to best interact with student devices in the classroom, teacher devices in the classroom, uh, provide good audio, good visuals, um, the ability to really tap into that, uh, um, that all of those features that we've really seen um, in distance learning and we anticipate um, are going to be used in various ways as we move forward in our in-classroom um, experiences. So with that, um, it is, the recommendation is that the Board of Education approve the allocation of funds to replace interactive panels for elementary schools and authorize the Executive Bus uh, Director of Business Services to finalize contracts up to $750,000. Thank you. Uh, may I have a motion for the recommendation in front of us? So moved. Moved by Director Hume. Uh, second, please. Second. Second. Oh, Seconded by Director Chester. Uh, any questions or comments on the motion in front of us? I had a couple of questions. Yes, Director Hume, please go ahead. Um, I was curious, I just have, they're pretty small questions, but how many smart boards are being replaced and do we have them in all of the elementary schools? Um, so there, the, this plan is going to be replace about 200 um, interactive boards. Uh, smart boards originally, before the tech levy, smart boards were purchased by various funding sources. So there is an inequitable distribution across our elementary schools of smart boards. Um, and so this, this plan actually looks at uh, uh, leveling that out. So our pre-K, kindergarten through five, homeroom classrooms, art, music, digital learning, and then our focus areas will all be uh, receiving the new boards. Um, and so that, that equates to right around uh, uh, 200. Okay. That was actually part of why I was asking my question, because I remember my kids' PTO doing fundraisers for smart boards, probably when these were being purchased. Um, my, you mentioned that the majority of the boards are being replaced. Are we replacing all of the boards of this particular model, or are there some that aren't going to be replaced right now? There will be a few left that uh, we will be looking at in the future. Um, the majority piece, what we, what we did was we looked at those whole group instruction where you have large group of, groups of students in big classrooms. And then we know that we have smaller groups. So there are, there are smart boards that are in our special education, uh, some of our special education classrooms, uh, EL, intervention. They tend to be in the smaller spaces with smaller groups of students. And so we're having ongoing conversations about what makes the most sense moving forward uh, to meet the needs that they have as well. Um, when those were put in, our students didn't have uh, devices at the time. And so um, those are ongoing conversations. So the majority um, that we will pull out are going to be our, um, the model that I've, I've identified, our smart board 680s, uh, which are end of life. And over the course of the next year, we'll be cleaning up kind of some of the other um, options that we need. I think that last part touches on my last question, which is what's the expected remaining shelf life for the ones that are not being replaced mm -hmm. right now? Yeah, so if um, when when end of support happens, there's usually kind of a um, sunsetting period uh, when you can still upgrade uh, like the firmware for the device and keep the security. And then what will happen is after some time that will that will end. Um, and so we consider that we use a, a system for inventory management that uh, our tiers. So our tier four devices are the ones that start to become security issues. Right now, our smart boards, uh, the, this particular model that we're replacing, the majority of our smart boards are in tier three, and they'll be moving into tier four within the next uh, year and a half. Great. Thank you very much. 
Any other uh, comments or questions? I just wanted to dovetail on your comment, Director Hume. This is a perfect example of how an approach with a lens of equity really makes a difference because I too remember when my kids were in elementary schools, you know, being aware of where the smart boards were being installed and where they weren't being installed. And so I just, I really appreciate, Rachel, the approach that you're taking and, and our approach overall um, because it does impact every single one of our students. So thank exactly. you. Any others? Okay. Uh, then we will, uh, Ms. Kenny, will you please call the roll? Saeed? Aye. Worm? Aye. Hume? Aye. Connor? Aye. Chester? Aye. Miller? Aye. Alt? Aye. Okay, the uh, motion to approve replacement purchase of classroom panels pa passes unanimously. Next, we will um, have a recommendation to approve on a first reading basis changes to policy 513, student promotion, retention, and program design, 601, school district curriculum and instruction goals, and 603, curriculum development. Uh, de uh, speaking on it will be Amina Afdal, Director of Curriculum, Instruction, and Assessment. Thank you so very much, uh, um, <clears throat> Chair Miller. Uh, the policies that I'm bringing to you uh, are focused on a couple of different things. Uh, the first is uh, focused on, um, I believe that this is the 513, um, is uh, updating some language. Uh, there, um, the content of the policy itself needs not change. Uh, it does drive uh, the, the guidance that we have for um, promotion and retention. However, the language seemed outdated and um, the, through the guidance of the uh, policy review committee was updated to be uh, a little more inclusive and reflective of uh, a proper representation. Um, I will uh, look for a motion um, t on the uh, recommendation in front of us. Just for clarification, all three policies, not one at a time. I'm just yep. 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 presenting all three. Yep. <laughs> yep. Mm -hmm. yep. That's how we do it. Yep. So, motion? So moved. So moved <laughs> by Director Chester. Second? Second. Seconded by Director Saeed. Uh, very good. Uh, any uh, questions or comments? Seeing none, Ms. Kenny, will you please call the roll? Werb? Aye. Hume? Aye. Connor? Aye. Chester? Aye. Miller? Aye. Alt? Aye. Saeed? Aye. And the motion in front of us passes unanimously. Uh, we will now move to uh, recommendation to approve on a first reading basis changes to policies 422, policies incorporated by reference. 501, school weapons policy. 502, search of student lockers, desks, personal possessions, and students' person. And 526, hazing prohibition. Uh, on this matter, we'll be speaking Brian Gersich, Assistant Superintendent. Yep, thank you again, Chair Miller. Um, I will be talking through the policies to explain the proposed changes as those were just listed uh, by Chair Miller. I am gonna speak through them briefly. I know that 422 is listed first because they are listed numerically, but I'm actually gonna cover that one last just because it fits a little bit better with the purpose of why that came forward at this time. Mm -hmm. So I will start with policy 502, uh, weapons policy. You'll just notice on the first page under definitions, uh, some broader language to I think modernize stun guns to include a, a, a more common understanding of what those devices would include. Uh, page 5013, You'll notice item seven has a little additional language. This is where someone is not considered to be in violation of the weapons policy if they possess one of those items uh, and have prior permission, permission from the school principal or a director of a child care center, someone in charge of that building to be able to do so. 
but what was added based on the recommendation of the policy committee was some language that would say when they have that permission, they need to make sure that they are contacting the superintendent and following established applicable procedures, which could include, for example, if something is coming in as a part of a lesson, maybe it would be a school resource officer that is supporting bringing some object into school if there was for a, a replica antique of some kind that was coming in. Again, it's more and more that these things are rare, but it still should be in policy so that it's covered um, as a part of a, of, a, of a practice. Those are the recommendations within policy 501. Uh, 502, search of student lockers, desks, personal possessions, and student person. You'll see a handful of changes on 502-3. Starting at the top, you'll see some language that is taken out uh, related to strip searches by law enforcement. Uh, our more recent SRO agreement takes this out and does not permit a school resource officer, school resource officer from conducting strip, strip searches. Certainly if an officer had probable cause to arrest a student and thereby takes that student to the police station, they're no longer a student, they are now with the police department and I'm not speaking to what their rules may be. This is the, the school side of things that they would not be conducting strip searches. Directives and guidelines, you'll notice there's some language that actually talks about guidelines for things like tape and lockers and standards of cleanliness. The committee felt that this really did not fit the intent of the policy, which is about search and seizure, not about cleanliness of lockers. Uh, there's nothing wrong with the language other than it just doesn't seem to fit. And so we will be removing it from here and making sure that this is in our handbook, which is still, again, our ability to put those rules in there and have students adhere to the fact that they need to take care of school district property. Uh, and then you'll see in the next two changes, similar in uh, previous sections six and seven, uh, about search of contraband and, and uh, violations, changing legal officials to law enforcement. The intent there is if you find something, you are calling in police officers. And I think the committee felt that legal officials was a bit more vague and could be considered, for example, uh, a lawyer. Uh, and again, the intent here is that this is gonna be given over to police officers if you find something like drugs or alcohol or other things that a student shouldn't have in school. And then 526, hazing prohibition. You'll notice there's just an addition of a cross-reference in the back. This came forward as a part of ensuring that policies also apply to volunteers and contractors. You'll notice that is stated in general statement of policy part A, that volunteers and contractors are in there, but there was some language that talked about developing a method to discuss with students and employees Realistically, after reviewing with uh, Director Stacy Silva and Director Lisa Ryder, there are things written into our contracts, but that's also where if you read policy 422, which is why it comes in, this is where 422 came before the committee, is that that is a list of all the policies that would, are, that would apply to everyone, including volunteers and contractors. And so the decision was made to add that cross-reference to policy 522, hazing prohibition does apply, and then add that to policy 422. And then the committee in bringing that change forward then also had an opportunity just to review policy 422 and suggested a couple others that would naturally also apply to volunteers and contractors, including our equity access and excellence in education policy 501 and policy 415 bullying prohibition. Uh, I just wanna note that as those other policies come forward, we'll have to add these cross references as well uh, but certainly for this point, it at least puts it straight out in front that these are the policies that would apply to, to all people who are associated with our district. And so the recommendation is that the Board of Education approves on a first reading basis, changes to policy 422, policies incorporated by reference, 501 school weapons policy, 502 search of student lockers, desks, personal possessions, and students person, and 526 hazing prohibition. Thank you. I will look for a motion on the uh, recommendation in front of us. So moved. Moved by Director Werb, second? Second. Seconded by Director Chester. Any uh, questions or comments? Seeing none, Ms. Kenny, will you please call the roll? Hume? Aye. Connor? Aye. Chester? Aye. Miller? Aye. Alt? Aye. Saeed? Aye. Werb? Aye. And the motion in front of us passes unanimously. That brings us to a close of our regular scheduled meeting this evening. We are now going to adjourn to two closed sessions, the first being a closed session as permitted by Minnesota Statute 
13D.03 to discuss ISD 191's labor negotiation strategy. That will be followed by a closed session as permitted by Minnesota Statute 13D.05, Subdivision 3A for the superintendent's e annual evaluation. Uh, so we are now adjourned. Uh, I will, um, let's take about a 10, 15, let's call it just a, it's 8.59. Let's reconvene at 9.15 uh, for a break and get them a chance to set up the room. Mm -hmm.